thank you for the promises that we have and for your presence here with us tonight. I pray as we look at your word, God, that you would just simply speak to our hearts, that we would be very much aware of what you want to say to us tonight. And Lord, that you would hear the cry of our hearts, that we want to be drawn nearer and only nearer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to take a moment and look at Psalm 63 tonight. Psalm 63. While you're turning there, it was the Apostle Paul who once said, I want to know Christ. That's interesting for Paul to say that. If ever there were a saved man, if ever there were an actively serving Christian, if ever there were someone who was actually suffering for Christ, the epitome of one who had laid it all down for Christ, it was Paul. And, it? Yeah, it was. and yet he says, I want to know Christ. He said that as a believer. He said that well into, I believe it was the second missionary journey. He'd been working for many years by that point. Some suggest even as many as 30 years. He had seen Christ the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. And he had seen a vision of Christ in Corinth, speaking to him, saying in Acts chapter 18, don't be afraid of them, you just keep on preaching, I'll take care of it. And yet, he says, he wanted to know Jesus. And I believe what he was saying is, I want to know him better and better and better. Draw me nearer nearer to your side, precious Lord. When you look at Psalm 63, the words of praise are here for the believer. It wouldn't make uh, very much sense uh, for these to be uh, for anyone other than one who had trusted the Lord. They'd be lost on those apart from the saving knowledge of God. But it is, I believe, the heart cry of the genuine believer to want to know God better and better. And if you have found Psalm 63 and are able to, I'd invite you tonight to stand in honor of the reading of God's Word. A Psalm of David when he was in the desert of Judah. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lifts my mouth will praise you. May God be honored the reading of his word. You may be seated. The soul made alive by God yearns for more of the Lord. We are not comfortable here in our earthly surroundings. And the longer we walk with Christ, the more we know Christ, the more that he is transforming us to be like himself the less we find ourselves attracted to this world and the more we want to be drawn nearer to Him. The child of God um, deeply desires to be in the Lord's presence. We yearn for fellowship with God. And that's uh, true every bit now as it was in David's day when he said, O oh Elohim, that is the Hebrew name for God that, that describes personally who God is. A desire to be in your personal presence. Not just in the corporation, but sitting at the feet of the CEO. <laughs> to belong in that fellowship with you, Lord. Oh, Elohim, you are my Elohim, my God. The confidence and the allegiance that is expressed in that phrase is, is very strong, and I think we notice that pretty easily. But those who are made new in Christ call the Lord Jesus Christ our own. 
He who came and sought us. He who came and bought us before even then. He who came and desired that we would be with Him. That it's uh, not that we first loved Him, but that He first loved us. And yet, nevertheless, though we belong to Him, we can call Him Lord. We can call Him our Savior and our friend. Oh, Elohim, oh God, You are my God. Earnestly I seek you. We realized from the note at the beginning of Psalm 63 um, that this was something that David said or comprised, uh, composed when he was in the desert, when he was fleeing from Absalom, his own son, who had incited rebellion against him. And, and David, though deposed and run off, was in this wilderness land, literally and figuratively in a wilderness land. He was overwhelmed by his troubles, and yet his greatest desire is simply to be in fellowship with the Lord. Just as a desert dweller, as someone who is lost in a dry and arid wilderness, would long for that water that their body needs to thirst for that water. David says his soul thirsts for God. What a perfect image. What a perfect image for the believer. A desert saps the strength. The arid climate creates thirst and even fatigue. Those of us who have lived uh, or even just spent a little bit of time in those dry, arid desert places, you understand how quickly... Uh, that can overwhelm a person. When we know uh, God, we have a, a longing for Him, a thirsting for Him, and, and we just have to have that uh, filling from Him. C.S. Lewis said that David's longing for God was so great that he had an appetite for God. Mm -hmm. And what else could satisfy the cravings that we have? Only Jesus could really satisfy. He expresses that satisfaction, you are my God. And then he says, earnestly will I seek you. Don't you feel that growing desire for the Lord in your life? Earnestly I will seek you. And the word earnestly could be translated as eagerly or immediately. In other words, something that I, I deeply desire to do, is something that's a priority to me, it's something that's very important. I, I seek you eagerly, but also immediately, as in priority, I seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, Jesus said. That we, we seek out that desire to have him, and, and it's because he's the most important, and because we know that he's the one that can satisfy us. He is our first resort to turn to in good times or bad. A lot of times people will say, and maybe they don't realize maybe what they're implying when they say, it. well, there's nothing else to do but pray, as though that's the last resort. <laughs> that's the first resort in any situation, yeah. good or bad. Talk to the Lord about it. Mm -hmm. And it's every resort all the way along uh, the line. Mm -hmm. The goal is uh, to seek Him. Uh, David says, my, my soul thirsts for you, and earnestly I seek you. To experience you. You know, many times people settle for things that are less than what God would give us. Mm -hmm. And you can think about that in terms of lost people and even backslidden Christians that are wandering around the world. And they think, well, I need money or I need pleasure or I need certain relationships or I need certain accomplishments or I need certain uh, possessions or these kinds of things. And, and yeah, those things don't satisfy. If anything, they just make you thirstier. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. It's like the uh, person who has been shipwrecked and they're surrounded by water in an ocean. If you drink the salt water, it'll only make you thirstier and eventually kill you. It will not quench your thirst. It will not meet the body's needs for water. Only fresh water will do that. That marvelous creation that God has given us, H2O. Uh, it is a wonder and a marvel what he has given and how he has put it all together. And so it is, we look at things of the world and they don't satisfy, they simply make us more discontent, and more upset. But I think there's even people who, uh, they, they settle for a little bit less than what uh, God would have them to experience 
by experiencing his presence. In other words, they settle for things that simply whip up the emotions. It sounds good and makes you feel good. It tickles the ears and people settle for the flesh. They reminisce about the past when God wants to talk about what he is doing in the present and where we're going in the future. Amen. Or they try to manufacture an event. Some worship services uh, in churches, and, and again, I don't want to judge, it's not my place to do that, but some that I have been aware of, they are so manufactured that every control of every light switch, of every microphone, of every song, of every note is all predetermined to create an effect rather than to lead us into the presence of God and let Him come and fill us. Amen. A lot of people are excited about what is emotional. And they think if, if it doesn't oh, work up the emotions, maybe God uh, isn't even there. But I'm reminded that Elijah was told by God to come into his presence. And Elijah discovered that God is not found in the wind, though it might be a very strong wind enough to break up the rocks. If God is not found in the earthquake, though it shakes the ground and is very impressive. God is not found in the fire. He was found in a still small voice, in his presence. Well, we might be in the middle of a worship service, and it does affect our emotions. We might be uh, studying in God's word or, or talking to him, and it might stir the emotions of one kind or another. But the end is not the emotion. The end is experiencing Jesus being in his presence. Even if it's a still, small voice that comes to you in the quiet of night. Probably everyone here can testify to at least one time in your life when you awoke in the middle of the night and everything was as still and quiet as it could be and God spoke to you and said something. Though you might have searched His Word for days and weeks and months and been in all the... Uh, uh, worship services every time the doors of the church were open, yet it was in that quietness. God spoke to you. Because our desire, as David expressed it here, is to seek Him, not the experiences of life. And he talks about those in, in verse 2. He says, hey, I've been in your sanctuary. I've beheld your power and glory, but I seek you. Not the experiences that go along with that. Because a past experience creates a desire to seek God. Uh, to seek those uh, fresh times with God. Those who have never met God, they don't know that they even need Him. But those who are followers of Christ, those, those who have given the heart, uh, we desire to draw nearer and have Him draw us even closer still. David had those experiences that made him desire God, to desire his face and not his hands. He didn't just uh, go to worship where the veil separated him and go through the motions of something called worship. He was looking for the real God and overjoyed at the prospect of communion with the Creator. He said, because your love is Better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as uh, I live. My soul will be satisfied because I'm going to be in your presence. He had a vision of God's holiness and power and glory. And he was well familiar with these things. The temple itself was filled with articles. Uh, that is, uh, uh, objects that uh, uh, made... One, look and consider the great works of the past and the power of God and the glory of God. They okay, say, so you know, in the middle of all that, it's being out here in the wilderness that I truly understand my desire is for you. Amen. How many of us have gone through those wilderness times in life and realized when the, the very things that we've been depending on have been washed away, <laughs> that what really matters is what is built on the rock, which is Jesus Christ. We can even thank God for those times because it clarifies for us what really matters, or I should say, who really matters. 
because of who God is, Christians want to praise Him for the rest of their lives. Verse 4, I will praise you as long as I live. It was a commitment, but it was one that was based on a lot of years of experience, a lot of ups and downs. Uh, uh, David, rather, is uh, entering into that last third of his life. So many things that we associate with the person of David have already passed. The uh, young shepherd boy, the one who was called out and anointed and told he would be king. Uh, the one who served in Saul's army. The one who was pursued by Saul. The one who had to flee and live in Philistine lands until it was time for him to come and take up his rightful place as king. Uh, the one who served and united the kingdoms of Israel. Uh, the one who stayed home when he should have been where kings belonged and, and was looking where he shouldn't have been and fell into sin. And yet was restored, though there was a price to it. The one who continued to serve God. All of that is past in his life when we read these words. And so he is saying, as one who had experience, I know whom I have believed, and I'm going to follow him, and I will praise you as long as I live. This was not, in other words, the commitment of some uh, brand new believer who didn't understand what it was all about. He had been seasoned. And he said, I, I know where I need to be. And that is praising God for the rest of my life. He commits himself here to a life of trust in the God who is his deliverer. He is saying, as I now bless you in this moment, I always will. I'll always be among those who are rejoicing in the name of our God. As we go through life, as God reveals His grace, we continue to rejoice. We continue to lift up. We can look back at the times when we were new Christians, when we were growing Christians, when uh, He delivered us, when He provided, when He met our needs. We can think back to mountaintop experiences. We can think back to a, a lot of long, dreary valleys. And this one thing we have discovered is that God is faithful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And just like the um, uh, home footprints, we can look back on our lives and we can see sometimes two sets of footprints and sometimes only one. And realize that it was God who carried us in those tough times of life. And that He has never left, never uh, broken one of His promises. And so we say, as I now bless you tonight, on this night, in June of 2015, we will always bless the name of Jesus Christ. In Jesus, there is something very special available. Verse 5. My soul will be satisfied. I believe he's already said that he has been satisfied. He knew God in the, the power and the splendor of worship in the sanctuary. He held your power and glory. He said, my soul thirsts for you and you're meeting my need in the present. Past and present, but also God's not going to change. My soul will be satisfied. And not just barely. One of the things about the English language is sometimes words kind of change or they kind of lose their meaning. And, and one of those places for me is uh, when Paul said uh, uh, he talked about his experience of praying about a very difficult time in his life. How that uh, Satan had uh, put a thorn in his flesh and he cried out to God for deliverance. And Jesus spoke these words to you, my grace is sufficient. <coughs> the word sufficient to me kind of means like, well, it just, you know, just kind of just meets your need. Well, I like the way it's expressed here in verse 5. It, God just doesn't do it in halfway. <coughs> and what satisfies, fulfills. There's a fullness to it. My soul will be satisfied. Like that person who sits down at the king's table surrounded by all the very best delicacies that there are. Because that's how God loves his children. He has lavished his love on us. My soul will be satisfied. 
things of the earth make us thirstier, but the things of God bless us beyond measure and beyond our expectation. The, the richest of foods in the Hebrew is literally an idiom, meaning the marrow and the fat. You know that part in the meal that makes it taste really good? It's a gravy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you, when you put that fat down in the, the baked bean, or in the green beans, rather, or baked beans, too, for that matter, and it just brings out that flavor, and everybody says, oh, that isn't good for you. Oh, it all tastes good. Yeah, that's what that phrase actually means here. But it refers to the joy of the Lord. It refers to the greatness and the compassion of the Lord. That goodness that you experience. The world's eaten out of a garbage can at best. Boy, isn't that a delicacy. <laughs> the child of God has spread before him or her the royal banquet. And Jesus says, come and eat. My soul will be satisfied as with the richest of foods, as with the fat and the marrow, the, the joy and the greatness and the compassion, the goodness, the finest, the choicest, a feast yeah. in the Lord's presence. I will be satisfied, but more than that, I'll be blessed. When our soul hopes in God, when we know His favor, when we are confident in Him, we have the best of the best. And in fact, we have something that has satisfied, is satisfying, will satisfy, and we can uh, claim with this psalm writer, with these words of God, thy loving kindness is better than life itself. Thy loving kindness is so incredible that I'd rather have uh, the Lord than to have uh, anything David said he knew God. He knew this loving kindness. He knew that God was his very own. And he longed for more of the Lord. Earnestly I seek you. Just like the Apostle Paul said, I want to know Christ. Paul wasn't content just knowing about Jesus. Or just doing a little bit part time for Jesus. And it's hard to imagine anyone who knew more about Christ than Paul did. 30 years of incredible work, and he cries out, I want to know Christ. He's still restless to know Him better. Mm -hmm. Theology will never satisfy the restlessness of your heart. Mm -hmm. Just knowing about God. Doing the work of God will leave you unfulfilled. It's only knowing Jesus better and better that will satisfy what causes that thirst. How can we, uh, as followers of Christ, grow deeper in Christ? Well, I'm convinced that we will grow deeper in Christ when we want Jesus. When we can say with David here, You're my God. Earnestly, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. I know you will satisfy me, but I am seeking you. Not just what God can give you. And He can give you a lot of things. He gives us abilities and talents. As the preacher this morning said, He gives us a supernatural gift to serve Him. He can provide and meet our needs. He can heal, He can help, He can strengthen, He can give us a lot of stuff. And He does invite us to come and ask for those things on our behalf, and especially to ask on behalf of others. But if we want the stuff more than Him, one, I think we're not going to get the stuff very often. And two, we're missing what is important here. When we want Jesus more than what He can give us, or more than what He can get us out of, that we've gotten ourselves into, or even more than that good feeling, we just want Jesus. Like Paul, who said, I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and share in His suffering. I want to know Him. I want to know everything there is to know about Him. I want to be like Him. I want to walk like Him, live like Him. I want to experience all this so that when I see Him face to face, uh, we already pretty closely resemble each other. Someone said that we seek God's face more than His hands. In other words, we seek 
his heart, his person, who he is, more than just asking him to give us stuff in prayer. Though he does invite us uh, to ask for our needs. That we seek him more than just feel good experiences. That we rely on him. There's a very old hymn. Um, the first time I ever heard it, it was uh, on a Gaither recording because they like to take some of those really old hymns and, and kind of bring them back and uh, revive them a little bit. And, uh, we sang one of those tonight, but a different one that I really like is called Sitting at the Feet of Jesus. It's a picture, really, of the passage of Scripture uh, with Mary and Martha. Your Martha, you know, is all busy and running around trying to get all these preparations because Jesus was in the house and she was just trying to serve. And, and there was Mary, and she was just sitting there listening to the teacher. Martha got a little upset and went to the Lord and started complaining. Get Mary working. And Jesus said, wait a minute. She's chosen the better part here. And what she has requested is not going to be taken away. That's the background for the hymn, but I love the, the whole idea of sitting at the feet of Jesus. Very special place. And I think that's a lot of what is expressed in Psalm 63, that we desire to be at his feet. And when we do, there's something that's just so right. When we want Jesus in that way, like Mary wanted it, it's not going to be taken away from us. And I believe that we grow uh, deeper in Christ and get to know Him better when we come with undivided hearts. After all, Jesus said, the pure in heart shall see God. When we come not with divided hearts or divided loyalties, but come simply surrendered and humble before Him. And yet there are some practical things that we can do. And uh, Just as we wrap things up tonight, I would say the, the most practical step to grow and, and to be fed and to be satisfied, to behold His power and glory and to uh, have this rich blessing is to stay in His Word. That's right. Because He speaks to us through His Word. And it's important that we as God's people remain in His Word. We seek Him through His Word. Yes, there are experiences and there are times of worship and things that will be consistent with His Word, uh, but also ways to bless us, but none more so than His Word. A person will grow cold or feel distant or stray without the Word of God in his or her life. D.L. Moody once said, The Bible will keep you from sin, or sin will keep you from the Bible. We need to be in the Word of God. And there's ways to keep it fresh by... Uh, praising God through it, praying it back to Him, uh, writing out our prayers to Him, making prayer lists, journaling all kinds of practical and specific things that we can do to help keep us focused and even for God to use to unlock new things and for the Spirit to speak to us as we focus on various verses, but staying in the Word and carving out time to be with Him. Draw near to Him, and He will draw near to you. <coughs> oh God, You are our God. Earnestly we seek You. We gaze upon You in the sanctuary to see Your strength and Your glory. We glorify You because Your faithful love is better than life itself. Lord, we do just come before You today.